Good morning. My name is Gisela Chulimski. I'm a professor of pediatrics and the chief of pediatric gastroenterology at Children's Hospital of Richmond, Virginia Commonwealth University. I also run the autonomic center there, the pediatric portion. I will talk today about the management of gastrointestinal autonomic complications. I have a few disclosures. My husband and I direct or, or co -own, are co-owners of a company called Pain Stickers that teaches practitioners how to manage chronic pain in the biobehavioral mode. Um, and also he is an advisor for Procter & Gamble. So I wanna start this talk talking about the relationship between autonomic symptoms, functional GI symptoms, and general, generalized hypermobility. These three um, syndromes overlap uh, very often. And this overlap of pain, hypermobility, fatigue, functional GI symptoms, fibromyalgia is what now the National Institute of Health, the NIH, is calling um, chronic overlapping pain conditions. So why? do people get functional GI disorders? This we are still learning. So what we understand in 2022 is that a certain group of individuals have certain risk factors. And those risk factors include stress, genetic factors, pain in infancy. And there is a lot of um, emphasis now in looking at the role of the microbiome. But at this point, they're healthy, they're not a patient yet. Um, outwardly, they look totally normal. Then something happened at some point that is a trigger. That can be an infection, a surgery, inflammation, sometimes it's a significant psychological stress. And then they develop a functional gastrointestinal disorder. And what we have found is that when they develop this gastrointestinal disorder, they also develop a lot of comorbid conditions. So what are these comorbidities? In adults, the comorbidities of functional gastrointestinal disorders are inter interstitial cystitis, pelvic pain, vulvodynia, chronic fatigue, dysmenorrhea, temporomandibular joint disorder. In pediatrics, we see a lot of orthostatic intolerance, hypermobility, fibromyalgia, and um, migraines. Some years ago, we published um, the comorbidities that we see in our autonomic neurogastrointestinal clinic. And as you can see, more than 90% of the patients have dizziness, migraines, chronic fatigue, chronic nausea. S many have sleep problems. Uh, about 20 something percent have fibromyalgia. And interestingly, despite being a autonomic and neurogastrointestinal a clinic, the prevalence of POTS is only about 30% and syncope 40-45%. So what is postural tachycardia? In the adult population, it's an increase in heart rate while upright of more than 30 beats per minute or a baseline heart rate of 120 beats per minute. And the increase in heart rate has to happen in the first 10 minutes of the head up tilt. They can't be a drop in the blood pressure when they're upright, and they need to have associated orthostatic symptoms, lightheadedness, dizziness, getting sweaty. When we talk about POTS in pediatrics, the definition is a little bit different. The definition in pediatrics requires an increase of 40 beats per minute when we go from supine to standing. And again, they cannot be a drop in the blood pressure, and they need to have orthostatic symptoms. So what are the key factors that need to be present in the definition of POTS? The symptoms have to be chronic. It can't just be that you have symptoms for a week. If for that, you could be sick, you could be dehydrated. The illness has to be present for several months. It's interesting that when POTS was diagnosed or described, I should say, by Paula Sandroni in 1999, she talked about um, chief complaints of POTS, like dizziness, lightheadedness, lower extremity weakness. But even in 1999, Paula noticed that these patients had nausea, bloating, early satiety, and abdominal pain. 
In pediatrics, as well as in adult, POTS comes with a lot of comorbid conditions like chronic fatigue, migraines, sleep problems, gastrointestinal issues, headaches, chronic pain in various locations, renal-like symptoms, and chronic nausea. But that doesn't mean that all those symptoms are due to the orthostatic challenge. We did a study some years ago again, in our patient population in the autonomic and neurogastrointestinal clinic. And we compared patients that came to us in that had POTS defined by the tilt table test and those that did not have POTS. And if you look at the uh, striped columns, those are the ones without POTS. If you looked at the solid column, those are the ones that had POTS. And what we can see is that the comorbid conditions were the same, the fatigue, the C sleep problems, even if we look at the column of dizziness, we see that the POTS and the no POTS patients had the same comorbid conditions. So it seems that POTS is not the driver of the comorbid conditions that are present in POTS. So when is POTS truly the driver of those symptoms? Only when those symptoms are replicated in the upright position. If you develop lightheadedness, fatigue, palpitation, nausea, epigastric abdominal pain or headaches, when you are upright and then it gets better when you're lying down, that belongs to POTS that is produced by the orthostatic challenge. If those symptoms do not happen in the upright position or they happen 24 hours a day, that is not due to the orthostatic challenge. The importance of that is that only when we treat POTS, the only symptoms that are going to get better is the ones that happen during the orthostatic challenge. So what happened with bed rest and POTS? POTS, I mean, sorry, bed rest is not the cause of POTS. But what happened many times in patients with POTS is that they feel so bad that they end being in bed many hours and being inactive. And the lack of physical activity produces deconditioning. When we are deconditioned, our POTS gets worse. We know that bed rest produces decreased blood volume and cardiac size, redistribution of the blood. We develop atrophy of the skeletal muscle pump that are due to disuse, and that's so needed in, in, to pump the blood back to the heart. And this decreased vasoconstriction. So the lack of activity and the bed rest in patients with POTS only intensifies and perpetuates the POTS. Now let's look at the overlap of generalized hypermobility in POTS. A big problem that is happening in our science is that most of the studies are not done with the new criteria for hypermobility described in 2017. But this study here looked at that using the new criteria. And they found that 31% of patients with POTS also met hypermobility EDS criteria. And 24 patients of POTS met generalized joint hypermobility criteria without meeting the hypermobility EDS. So if we add the two numbers, about 55% of patients with POTS have some hypermobility spectrum. So this is a different study. This is an older study, and they only used Byton. And they uh, look at patients that they describe as having generalized hypermobility if they had a Byton of four or more, and they were healthy controls if they had a Byton of two or less. And what they found is that the patient that had Byton of four or more had more syncope, presyncope, palpitations, chest discomfort, fatigue, and heat intolerance. Also, the generalized hypermobility, as we can see here, had in 78% of the subjects, they had a positive tilt, versus in the controls, only 10% had a positive tilt. And with that, they mean that they found either orthostatic hypotension, POTS, or orthostatic intolerance. Now, the are other gastrointestinal symptoms that can happen in patients with POTS, but those that are associated or directly related to POTS are the symptoms that only happen when the patient is upright and then they get better when they are supine. 
So if your nausea gets replicated during the head up tilt and improves when you lie down again, when you expand the blood volume with fludrocortisone, salt, and fluids, you will see that um, the symptoms may improve. And that was described by many um, researchers like Sullivan and Fortunado. And what they found is that not only the dizziness gets better, but um, the abdominal pain, the flushing, and missing school improves too. What's about gastric emptying and EDS? Most of the uh, Patients with EDS have normal or accelerated gastric emptying, um, but the vast majority, as we can see, from 76 subjects, only 17 were abnormal. And in the next studies from 66, 63 subjects that had GI symptoms and EDS, um, only uh, 12 had delayed gastric emptying. So delayed gastric emptying is not common in EDS, obviously you need to investigate it when there are four gut symptoms. Now, what's about if we look at gastroparesis and POTS now? Again, only nine to 18% of patients with POTS have gastroparesis. The vast majority had normal gastric emptying or accelerated. And it's interesting to note that the symptoms of delay and accelerated gastric emptying are very similar. They both present with nausea, a feeling of faint, and bloating followed by diarrhea. So just the fact that they have nausea, feeling faint, and bloating does not mean that that's gastroparesis. How do we, and I'm talking now about myself, th think about nausea? When I ask an, a patient about the symptoms of nausea, I want to know if the symptoms are present in the morning when they first wake up. If they're present in the morning when they're still um, lying down, then the differential is gastroparesis or a migraine component. If the symptoms are after eating, then you need to consider gastroparesis or dyspepsia. If the symptoms get worse in the upright position, then probably it's an orthostatic cause. And if the symptoms are associated with headaches or photophonophobia, then you need to think that maybe they have a migraine variant. How do we treat it? So I know that this was discussed quite a bit by Emily. Um, we need to have a biobehavioral approach, exercise, physical therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, lifestyle changes. That should be the first treatment line in POTS. Um, so we want to increase the fluids. We, teach, we tell um, adolescents and adults 2.5 to 3 liters of fluids per day. We can monitor how much salt they're getting by checking the salt load in the urine by getting a 24-hour urine. And we would like to see that the urine sodium is greater than 170 millimoles in 24 hours. So that can let you know if the patient is taking enough salt, if they're compliant with the salt. So usually they require between 3 to 15 grams per day. Um, the autonomic society would say around 10 grams per day. I tend to start with two grams twice a day extra to what they have in their diet. Elevating the head of the bed will reduce the nocturnal microgravity, high pressure hose with abdominal binder, uh, tilt training, water jogging, jogging, and aerobic conditioning. Water jogging or water aerobic is great because there is no gravity in the pool and the patients with POTS will not um, feel faint. Or, But you need to be careful when you get out because then obviously when you're out of the water, you return to your full gravitational pull. Sometimes you get vasodilation when you're in the pool because the pool is warm. Um, so be careful when you get out of the pool. If the, the patients with POTS don't have access to water, to, to working in the pool, a recumbent bicycle or a rowing machine where they are more in the sitting position is much better than trying to exercise in the upright position where they will really have very little endurance and not be able to do it. And the key issue is that we need to start slow and we need to increase slow. We fail when we tell the patient exercise 30 minutes a day. Sometimes they're so deconditioned that I'm just happy if they can go from the bed to sitting on the couch and be upright with the leg hanging down. Then we go to maybe five minutes, maybe three minutes of rowing machine or recumbent. 
and we increase it very little. The key issue is to make improvement, not to go very fast, and then for three weeks, they can't do anything. So adding salt is very important. We know that um, salt improves the orthostatic symptoms. It decreases the orthostatic tachycardia. If the patients had fainting, increases the time to the presyncope, and also increases the, um, the head up tilt or the standing systolic blood pressure. The, that is that not, uh, it does not increase so much the seated, seated or the supine systolic blood pressure. So we need to give high salt diet in these patients. And it seems that the salt affects mainly the orthostatic blood pressure. Problem with the salt is that many, many times it produces nausea and patients have intolerance to the salt. This is a study also of self, self train, a tilt training. Here the patient stands with kind of their feet a foot away from the wall and they stand at about the 70 degree from the wall. And there has to be a safe location, if possible carpeted, no furniture. And they start doing that three, four times a day. They start two, three minutes, whatever is their capacity. And they slowly, slow it and increase the time they're standing. And as you can see that the duration of standing with orthostatic training, it really increases to the time to faint in patients that have a history of fainting. Compression garments, they're very important. Again, I know that this was discussed in the previous talks too. The key issue is either abdominal compression or abdominal compression plus a thigh high with a pressure of 30 to 40 millimeters of mercury. Problem with this uh, compression garments is that they are difficult to, to, to put in the morning. Um, and we also know that the knee height really don't help. Um, now they are developing a new automated abdominal inflatable binder that can be selectively inflated to 20 or 40 millimeters of mercury. Um, so there is promise there. If patients cannot tolerate the, the thigh height, just do the abdominal. Um, many times, not only they're difficult to put, but if in hot weather, um, they are very hard to tolerate. Let's go to medication, mitrogen. Mitrogen is great for arterial problems, so it works great in orthostatic hypotension. It's a pure alpha-1 agonist, does not cross the brain barrier, has a four-hour duration, so you can give it every four hours. The key issue is not to lie supine once you have taken it for at least four hours for the, the risk of a supine hypertension. Fludrocortisone is a mineralocorticoid. At high dose, produces an aldosterone-like action, so increases volume. At low dose, less than 0 0.2 milligrams per day, even 0 0.05, which is half a pill every other day, sensitizes the alpha receptors. Um, that's usually the dose we use, the half a tablet every other day. If you go to higher doses, you need to monitor potassium and magnesium. Now, what happened with lower GI symptoms? The lower GI symptoms are truly not produced by POTS, but some of the POTS medications improve the GI motility. So that's why I added it to the talk. We know that constipation is common in children with EDS. We know that it's more common in boys than in girls. Um, and that about a 50 something percent of children with hypermobility EDS have also GI complaints. Um, we also know that about 70 percent of patients of, with POTS would, would have altered bowel pattern. But again, that is not correlated to orthostatic challenge. So this is not a direct complication or, or effect from, or to, from POTS. So, um, this slide shows that a joint hypermobility is associated with IBS. Um, we look in, here in the black boxes is they are, don't have generalized hypermobility, the gray one they do. When we look at IBS constipation, we see that there is much more uh, frequency of IBS constipations in the joint hypermobility versus um, the people that did not have joint hypermobility and on the contrary, when we looked at the IBS diarrhea predominant, 
we see that that is more common in the non-hypermobility group and less so in the hypermobility. So pyridostigmine is a medication that works great in orthostatic intolerance, but also works great improving the motility of the gut. So this study from Singer look at patients with orthostatic intolerance and they took 18 patients with orthostatic intolerance and there was an open label single dose study. And if we look here at the bottom of the slide, we see that before taking the pyridostigmine, this was the main symptoms, which was four. And after taking pyridostigmine, the, GI, the orthostatic symptoms really decreased. Sorry, this was six and it decreases to four. So this was a significant decrease in the orthostatic symptoms just with one dose of a pyridostigmine. And here on this side, we see that uh, we look at the heart rate, which is the supine is in the light color and the dark, the, the solid bar is the um, heart rate uh, during head up tilt. And what we see is that without the pyridostigmine here, um, this is the main heart rate. When we give pyridostigmine, there is a decrease in the supine heart rate but it's a much bigger decrease in the standing or in the up, uh, head up head up tilt uh, heart rate. So it really improves the orthostatic intolerance. The nice thing too is that um, pyridostigmine increases the motility. So if you have a patient with orthostatic intolerance and constipation, this is a great choice. Um, pyridostigmine from a GI point of view decreases the abdominal distension increases the bowel movement frequency, and also improves the enteral feeding tolerance. What you need to tell the patients is that they make a fasciculation if the dose is too high. At a dose of 30 milligrams to 60 milligrams, and I'm talking about an adult three times a day, I have very, very, very seldom seen fasciculations. So in summary, there is a big overlap or a significant overlap between POTS, generalized hypermobility and gastrointestinal symptoms. Some gastrointestinal symptoms are manifestation of orthostatic intolerance, which includes POTS. And the symptoms that are secondary to the orthostatic intolerance or the orthostatic challenge are those that develop in the upright, upright position and will resolve when they are supine. That includes nausea and sometimes abdominal pain. There are other gastrointestinal issues that may be associated with POTS um, that may not be related directly to the orthostatic intolerance, such as constipation, but they may respond to some of the medications that we use to manage the orthostatic intolerance, such as pyridostigmine. So when you have somebody that has orthostatic intolerance and constipation, consider pyridostigmine. Thank you so much for listening.